Open Science Festival. Meet, share, inspire. Care. Welcome to our second panel. So, uh, in this panel, first I will do an introduction, then I will welcome our panelists, and each panelist will make a five minute introduction with a statement. Uh, yeah, I think I have my slides. Could you start with slides? Then we will have half hour to discuss the topic together. So, what is our topic? Data rush in the wild. The real life, real world data. So we're all talking about open science and reusing the data. And now, in this panel, we will discuss challenges and opportunities of this real-life data. So you might be wondering why we are looking at this wall. This is, some of them uh, you might know, dry Irish uh, uh, stone wall. How it's made, like uh, you can see this type of walls all over the island. Uh, they collect the stones, they build up together without any uh, connecting material. Why we are looking in that? In a minute. If you are working with data you gather through a uh, scientific process, if you start from uh, formalizing your hypothesis, then define what type of data you need, then uh, go and collect and gather this data, you got very uh, well prepared data set. For example, you know what to measure, and uh, you have very nicely shaped data set. Uh, this is mostly done with experiments or clinical trials where you generate your own data. The outcome is, if you consider this data blocks as a wall block, you get a nice British garden wall. All data has the same size, same attributes, it's very high quality, well structured, well created, you know the metadata, so on and so forth. But if you go wild and just try to reuse existing data sets, it can be anything, it can be Google Maps, it can be climate data, it can be sensor data, uh, mobile devices, theater data, you have a totally different picture. Now you got the Irish wall because all this data uh, items are different, you don't have uh, same structure, you don't, you don't have same features, uh, the, your data set is sparse, you have low quality, you don't know about the license, if even you can reuse data or not, uh, you don't know the data description, but the question is still, can you use this data to build this wall or not? So today we will discuss a little bit about uh, this uh, problems, challenges with this real life data. Our first panelist it is Edith Herzog. I would like to welcome Edith. Uh, so Edith, uh, please come. Edith works uh, uh, in vi uh, vision and values. So she is uh, one of the great contributors for open science research data infrastructures at the EU level. Some of you know uh, her well with Fair Data Working Group. She helped the community a lot to set uh, the guidelines for Fair Data and make it possible. So now I will just hand over to Edith to make her statement. And Thank you. And there's a slide set. Yes, I, I, ha I have a slide set. So if you can come with the slide set, I would be very thankful. It's a, uh, this is the real data or the data challenges. Can you see that? Can you help with it? Yes. Yeah, it's coming. Yes. Yeah, so this is what my but small consultancy does at the moment. You can see with the, with the, with the words uh, what I'm doing in general, but I'd like to go to the second page immediately. I don't know how to move the... Oh, okay. yeah? Okay. yeah, all right. So I move to the second slide to introduce myself a bit. So I spent 10 years in the research. I worked in the food sector, yeah, in the food research. And it's important, it's, uh, it's by... You use the example of the open air, I, so it's a food. Uh, then I spent... Um, 
10 years in the business working on the chemicals, that's uh, your second example with the chemicals, how advanced they are. Then I turned to politics, I was a few years in the national parliament and 10 years in the European parliament, legislating uh, many, many techy issues. And then finally I ran the consultancy uh, now. Uh, I'm engaged with the research in many ways and form. I am evaluating European research projects. Uh, I am also part of the some of the experts groups like the high level group for Euroatom research or uh, recently for evaluating the ERICS. And um, yeah, uh, I'm very proud that I am for very long serving Research Data Alliance with the 13,000 community members who are all doing something which Daniel just described. Yeah, So I am very, very happy to, that, uh, to be that part of community and support them with my governance kind of uh, expertise. And I'm chairing the widening group in the Science Business Magazine. You might know it from Brussels. So this is what I'm doing. Why it is important? The first question I want to raise with you, that is the real data issue unique for research and for health? And my answer is definitely not. In the 90s, we had many, many food diseases, exactly in the same time when 30 years ago, in 1993, the European Union decided the single market. And the people wanted to export foods across Europe, but they didn't trust each other. And with the diseases, it was a hindering factor you cannot imagine. Therefore, the food sector was the first. We had to go for identified systems and processes, as you described, Daniel, for food from the field to the fork, yeah? Back in the 90s. So if the researcher says to me, we cannot do it, I might response, if the farmers could do it, you may try. Hmm? Yeah, so that's my response. Then I arrived to the European Parliament in the 2004, and it was the biggest file with the 2,400 pages as a main legislative document so far with the other 3,000 page of annexes, we did the same for chemicals. And then we met the problem of the real data because the chemicals from the nature were far more difficult to regulate than the chemicals in the factory when you put two kilo of that and the three kilo of the other thing yeah, in the lab. Yeah, but the real data, imagine the food product, imagine the concrete, imagine the alloys, whatever you imagine, which is from the nature, is so variable we could not do it. And then, as I was the one of the reporter, uh, I, I, was, I became famous by this. I introduced those three elements to be, to be able to do it. We used the threshold for the natural products, which is the same. You call it granularity in the research data. We introduced that it's enough to do once, and then the people have to use the same pattern all the time, because otherwise it's just not feasible. And we had to give the time frame. Data is similar in many ways. In more, way than, in more ways than you think, because data is variable. Like the strawberry, which 10 minutes after you collect it has a different chemical structure, and you still wish to enjoy it. Yeah? So it's very, very similar, but it's special too, because you have the human rights connected to the health data especially, yes? So you are not unique, but you are very special. Uh, so my uh, second statement is the challenge, yeah? So, and I put here both. I was chairing in the Research Data Alliance the FAIR Data uh, Maturity Model Group. And it's easy to say uh, when the FAIR can apply, so technically it's possible to do because FAIR is that making it possible, find, access, um, interoperable, and reuse. Yeah, so it's kind of easy. We don't do it, but it's kind of easy. But it's far more difficult to open it. Yeah? that people want to do it, yeah? The cultural change you described. And I described the other thing that from metadata to fair, it's easy. From lab to metadata, it's not so easy. And from real data to metadata, it's still in front of us. It's not done. So you are very much welcome to help us uh, to get it done. Uh, so what is the scale and the skies? We just entered to the sensor age, yeah? The research is moving out from the labs. It's not only the climate data moves out from the lab, but imagine if the 600 million diabetes patient would send that data each morning, 8 o'clock, and then you would have the 6 million data to manage. Imagine the scale, that what kind of data we are talking about it. Uh, who will decide about archiving? What we are doing with the data cemeteries? Yeah, I think that it's a valid question, not only for libraries, but for each of our 
personal c um, pieces as well. Today, the average copy we save is 130. Do we need 130 copies? Would it be enough maybe to have five to redundancy or 10? Definitely not 130. You are worrying about the climate, worry about the 130 copies. How many copies you do? Yeah? Efficiency, effectiveness, etc., etc. How many data centers should we build from public money to save those 130 copies? Yeah? Th these are the high level questions you might have to think uh, to understand that why you wish to be committed not only to the non-diesel cars, but also to those kind of uh, added values. Uh, what does it mean for the cost uh, and therefore the access? We have so many poor who has no access. Maybe they could use those da database spaces if we would clean up the spaces and uh, use the public money for it. And the question I wanted to show you, we do not know where we are. We are definitely not at the top. Yeah, we are somewhere down in the beginning or maybe even earlier. So it's just coming, and in your lifetime, it will be there. So it's better to learn it first. Uh, metadata is a big step. The good uh, trust and identity system is necessary. We do it for the researchers. We have the EduRom. You, you have EduRoms, I think. That so, so you have the trust and identity system. The system knows who you are. We have now the PID for the metadata. It's in progress. Uh, we have something for a software. And we start in the Research Data Alliance to have a working group uh, to have a PID for the instruments. Because the instruments are changing, then of course the result is changing, so we have to do something about it. Uh, it's a technical question and it's a governance challenge. But then, look at the RD emission statement. We build the technology and the technical and social bridges. And the social bridges are much bigger that you want to do it, you can do it. If you cannot do it, you are able to learn it. If you are not able to do it because your managers do not allow you to do, do it, then we have a systems, yeah, the directors of the universities and the top managers in the research institutes look at it as an opportunity and they do not wish to keep the actual status quo. So the change is very much the societal. And in the RDA, uh, RDA we, we fight for the societal challenges. So, in the RDA, the first uh, societal principle response is the care that we wish to provide right uh, for the data for the, uh, for the aboriginal tribes in Australia, for the Indians in uh, Amer North America, to the Inuits in the Arctic, and for the minorities maybe in Europe. Yeah? So we want to give a rights for those who do not stand for their rights also in the data. It's called the care. You can share it on the... the yeah? So fair is a technical issue, same trust. Yeah, because the trust can be done by all the processes, etc., if they are documented. But open is a societal issue. It's a culture, it's ethic, it's a legislation, it's a practice. And it's not surprised that four of us, we are working now on the ethics uh, intergroup uh, together with OYA uh, to do something with it. Work on technical solutions to deploy them. I think that it's important. We have some technical solutions, but we don't necessarily deploy them. Uh, we work on the societal challenges globally and locally, yeah, from the Inuits to the G7 or G20. Uh, we work on the governance on the right level. It has not to be very heavy, but something has to be there, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, we have to agree the access rules and the quality measures, and we have to be able to scale and sustain. And the most important is the last sentence. Do you think that if you cannot do it, nothing happens? No. The private companies will come and cherry-picking your data. If you look at CNN, CNN, just today, you go to the stock exchange yeah, the data. There is a little, little sign in the corner. The data is a 15 minutes old. So imagine the financial market data within 15 minutes arrives out from the competitive stage. All the big boys did their job. Yeah? It's available for public within 15 minutes. What does it mean for the future for you guys? Yeah, I think it's very important to think and see the others, what they are doing. So where we are now, you could think, many of you, many, when, when I go to the presentations, you think we are here. Are we here? Not by me. We are here. I think that in the last 10 years, we arrived from the mission non-possible to the mission possible. But the question, are we ready to Go for the societal challenge ourselves. Are we ready to be the leaders? Are you ready to be the leaders? Are you to be the flag 
for the next coming decade. Thank you. Thank you, Edith, for a very nice uh, introduction talk. Our next, next speaker is Inkwil Odegar. She is from Gerses and she works on social sciences in very, very sensitive topics such as children in war. And uh, also she's a very active member of RDA. I would like to welcome Inkwil. And she also has a yeah. presentation. <laughs> So, um, thank you very much, uh, Oya, for this nice introduction and also for inviting me to be here today to be able to share my big dedication and also part of the research process that we are struggling with in a very specific area. Um, it, I think it fits, and thank you, Edith, too. I think you gave a wonderful introduction to also what I uh, want to talk about, uh, and just very briefly. Um, it's a very specific topic uh, on children born of war, where I think... Uh, I would like to start just giving you a very brief idea about who are they. I think it's essential to understand the next step when I'm talking about the data and the sources and the challenges we're dealing with. So the children born of war are a very specific group of children that have been ignored by society, by politicians and by academia for always. These are children that are fathered by enemy or peacekeeping forces in conflict and post-conflict settings. Um, they can belong to, well, many of you know maybe about children that were fathered by the Allied forces in post-World uh, War Germany. We have in Norway, I'm Norwegian, a lot of the children fathered by the German soldiers from the Bosnian War. You have the children born from the genocide, Rwanda, and today we're working in Ukraine. So we have a mixture of both real life and real time data because all is needed because it's a topic which is full of blind spots and of white spots. So, uh, the, and the relationship doesn't seem to really matter very much for the question of what is the data you can access, what's the information about these children that you can actually obtain. Of course, from the varieties of conflicts I just told you about, we're talking about children that are now maybe just conceived in the context of Ukraine to those that are now still from World War II living and also working with us in the research field. Born consensual, more or less the spectrum for those who are engaged in gender research and know about uh, war settings and the questions of uh, voluntarily versus non-voluntarily relationships, it's a really wide continuum. So far, our evidence, however, shows that for the children, if you take the child's perspective, we need to work on a very different areas. So, just to summarize the research and the areas that we have built in, or I built in a model, is based on what do we know? What did we know at the time when I developed this um, form? And it's also one of the questions, as you can see here, we have four different areas. And in all of these areas, we deal with very specific data sources that are required. We have very different disciplines that are engaged, and we have data sources of any kind, being it um, just research data, and research data is actually one of the newest and kind of very specific, of course, as you showed with the research method. We had a research question, but still we had to involve the children at stake, these adults, children born of war, because we didn't even know as researchers which questions would be relevant to include in the questionnaire, because we're dealing with hidden and vulnerable populations. Just to give you an idea on all these four areas where we've now we've come a real big way, but we have your picture that you showed on the front, not, not no not, not neatly nice kind of garden of flowers, we have a total mess. Only through triangulation, we can somehow at least get an idea of what could be close even to reality in this field. And still, so, so there's nothing like there's nothing that isn't data. That's why in a publication now um, that is coming out later on this year, I really tried to systemize a lot of the data sources and the challenges across all that we're dealing with. Process-generated data, the Norwegian children with their registries, including health data, those of you who know Norway, excellent registries. You can access 
your personal number, you can combine them. We know what has happened to these children. We know about how their education level, their income level, their divorce levels. Of course, it's registered data. So, and it's not open, and it was pretty tricky for the researchers who did it, but he got access to it and was able to really make a baseline study, which is unique in international research, showing what really happens, because it includes eight, um, over 1,000 people that he was able to uh, identify. Um, what, law reports, uh, photographs, very often in many areas, the first incident we have is either a movie, a film, uh, a diary, a picture, any kind of thing that can, a newspaper article, any kind of thing that can give us an indication that these children exist and that you can start getting the snowball activity going. Ukraine now, just to give an example, is where we are in the field, working with NGOs. It's all said, oh, there are no children born because there's a group called Abortion Without Borders that have been active in providing support to the women. However, we know about four children that have been conceived and born. That tells us, from my research experience, that they're very likely to be more. So what are we doing? Running advocacy campaigns with organizations on site in order to see in how far we are able to get more and more information. The first ones we need to work with are the NGOs, Medicines on Frontiers, that the first time I addressed them said, who are you talking about? What kind of children? In the meantime, we have gotten to the UN level, where even the UN files reports on children born of war, and where I've been in several meetings over the past years where they talk about the children born of war as if they've always existed. Well, they have, they just haven't been visible. I know there are very many of these research data cycles and they, that you can use. I found this for our purpose to be quite convenient. You all know this. But what I really try to do is what you, Daniel, also said. Working specifically in this article with my colleague Elke Kleinau, because in the meantime we have so many research projects, so many PhD students that need to be aware of the specific challenges ethically, methodologically, how far can you go, and we need to find a way of sharing it. And I can tell you, as you probably realized from my comment, there are very different understandings when it comes to sharing. Which leads me to my last slide. Just summarizing, I'll be happy to expand on this in the discussion afterwards. So, we're having all kinds of data sources that need to be analyzed according to the respective methodological principles. And, of course, we want, I want to have all of them to share this. I want to set up a virtual or on-site um, infrastructure coming from GESIS. That's one of the obvious steps, of course, you think about to be able to have it all in one place where people can access any kind of information that is possible. I work according to the principle, does let's not talk about why things cannot be shared, let's turn it around and say, why can it not be shared? Because that's a totally different kind of approach of moving forward to it. And in my opinion, very often there are big parts that could be shared because the next thing that happens is that it's not only researchers from academia, it's a huge business for the NGOs. Going, jumping on sexy issues, unfortunately, to obtain funding, which it is. And uh, you very often don't know the methodological basis, they don't share anything on the reports and or on the data, and they are very often the ones that are heard by the governments depending on the NGO you have. So we're dealing also with a huge ethical issue, also because if it's not shared, a lot of governments fund exactly the same research projects again. So in the meantime, going to DRC, a lot of the women that have been raped uh, ask, so what is in it for me? How many focus group interviews and how many uh, research projects do you need about that in order to you know, have? So I think it's a big issue and I try to communicate that all the time, we have the responsibility to work towards sharing data, also because it's an ethical issue. And that's, uh, but it's tricky. So of course, you, need, you know, and do you, all you need, so we're having so many different actors, and a lot of that information is simply not, it hasn't arrived yet, not on all these parts. The disciplines, the culturally, even in the research cycle, I've had all the experiences. This is what, why we published it, starting with the authorships. 
huge problems because it hasn't been clarified before. Psychologists have totally different ways of including authors and uh, then, for example, the social scientist. I say I, would, I don't want to be included on any publication that I haven't seen, well, which seems to be pretty normal in other areas, yeah? where I just say no, no way. So all of these challenges we have within the field, within one discipline, within one research group, and I can tell you it's not even, it doesn't multiply when you go interdisciplinary and internationally, it's exponential, yeah? So, but still, I'm optimistic, been doing this for 25 years, I never thought I'd be working on this still after 25 years, and obviously it will continue, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ingrid. So, we have different perspectives. Now, our next speaker is Julia Germa. Julia is a, a PhD student. She uh, studies informatics. Now she is uh, working as a medical data scientist as a part of University of Cologne Medical Faculty. And she is the one who desperately needs data. And she tries to work and reuse data. So we will hear her perspective now. Yeah, thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So as you've heard, my name is uh, Julia German. And uh, after my studies in computer science, I now jumped into the field of uh, data-driven medicine. And uh, in this short talk, I want to assess with you whether currently medical real-world data is fair. So whether it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But before we come to that, I would like to ask the question, why should we actually use medical real-world data for research? Why not only use experimental data or study data? Isn't it easier, like the wall we've seen, the neatly, neatly put wall? There I have to say that the field of data-driven medical research uh, wants to generate unbiased and reliable medical knowledge. And according, uh, so generally, it, for this it needs many data features for many patients. Because otherwise, we will have bias in it, or we will just have some blind spots somewhere. So we need as much data as possible, and I think for this we really need the real-world data. We cannot collect so much data uh, in studies and experiments. So coming to my second question, um, is medical real-world data fair for research? For this, I first want to introduce a bit the environment at a clinic. So you um, have a lot of specialist physicians, like oncologists, radiologists, and pathologists, which all, and all of them have their own data systems, like the cancer registry, the radiological information system, or the laboratory information system. Now, I come in as a researcher and want to access this data. But actually, it's in the property of the patient. And the patient is the, yeah, uh, the, the person that the data was gathered on. So let's see, in this environment, is the data findable? And the first experience I made in, um, here when I started my projects in data-driven medicine is that the systems are not interconnected. This has legal reasons. Uh, due to data protection, you cannot link them. But this also brings the challenge that if I ask now the radiologist whether the patient data he has also has some other data representations in the cancer registry, he just cannot tell me. Another challenge is that a lot of documentation in medicine still happens paper-based, so we if we have the information in the data systems, and in many data systems it is present, but usually as a PDF scan of the paper-based information, so we would need image recognition followed by NLP to get it in a machine-readable form. So uh, I would say not really findable <laughs> for us as computer scientists. The second question would be, is it accessible? And there we have the challenge that the data systems are created for primary care. So they are created in a way that the physician can access the whole uh, medical history of a single patient very easily. But for us as 
data scientists, it's very hard to access a few fe uh, features, data features for a lot of patients. That's just not how the systems are. Uh, the systems are just not de de designed for such use cases. And so we also lack interfaces supporting such kind of operations. Second challenge, also here, the paper-based form, which makes it hard to access the information, not only to find it. And a third challenge is that uh, legally, if you don't have special consent or special other legal um, exceptions, only the physicians, is, uh, physicians are allowed to access the data. So uh, I need to wait for the physicians to access, combine the data, anonymize it, and then I can have it. This leads to a lot of delays, which is why I put the little clock here. A fourth challenge is that um, the researchers often are insecure about legal and ethical, um, the legal and ethical framework, because at least for me, in my computer science studies, I never heard about <laughs> uh, legal regulations, data protection regulations, which I think is a shame, but I didn't. So uh, I was very insecure when I started my actual projects in the wild, <laughs> and uh, I didn't really know what am I allowed to do and what not. And um, another challenge on top of that is that we usually do not know currently whether a patient consented or not, because the consent management is done also paper-based, so we have the consents in the fi files and folders of the physician. Um, so we actually don't know whether the patient consented and to what they consented. And the patients are not reachable for us anymore when they left the clinics. The third question, is the data interoperable? And there I made the experience that the different systems have different case IDs, so mapping these entities is a challenge, and they sometimes also use different units. I mean, this is a rather minor technical issue, you can convert them, but it's a challenge. Coming to the last point, is it reusable? And there I say also the consent, the missing consent information is a big challenge in, in answering whether I can reuse the data or not, because the consent has to tell me whether I am allowed to reuse the data. And in the current system, we have a lot of project-based approvals. So the approvals from ethics committees, data protection offices, IT security offices, they are usually for single projects and getting broad <laughs> approvals is very challenging. So a lot of these governing entities are hesitant to give broad approvals. Um, so we actually compile the data set and afterwards, after the project, delete it again, which is not really uh, reusable then. So we have all these challenges, which brings me to my uh, conclusion that medical real-world data is not yet fair. But maybe we can change this. So to change this, I think we need technical changes, like digitalization plus automated data structuring. A lot of you are working on that. I've already heard that, so that's nice. <laughs> um, redesigning and connecting clinical systems where it's possible and where it's legally not possible, building data warehouses that somehow solve intermediate issues here. Then we need standardization and harmonization uh, to foster fairness and an optimized patient consent management, that the information of the patient consent is retrievable for us as researchers. But on the other hand, we also need cultural chain, uh, changes. It should read changes, not challenges. I'm sorry for that. Um, and uh, so we need patient empowerment and participation. We need data science education and teachings for the medical staff so that they can help us and there are less delays. We need optimized patient consent, not only the management, but also the consent itself should foster reusability, should foster uh, understanding on the side of the patient so that they can actually help research. And easing the legal framework or at least providing some guidelines for us researchers would, would help a lot to, yeah, to decrease the delays in projects and make data more fair. So let us start and I'm happy to discuss these issues. Thank you, Julia. 
And now I would like to welcome our last panelist, Daniel Mitchin. He doesn't need an introduction, but he's a big uh, maker and big enabler. Daniel, would you like to make your statement? Yeah, um, since I've spoken quite a bit already, I will keep it short. I will just focus on one aspect that is relevant for real-world data, and that is how to make the ethics process fair. Um, so, um, right now, if I read a paper, uh, at the end of it, there is typically a section, ethics something, which says, the research received ethical approval according to, and then there is typically some number, and all participants gave informed consent. But if I have that number, that already looks like something that a fair person is interested in. So I take this number, but I have nothing where I can put it. There is no system where I can enter this number. I get metadata about the process. When did they submit their request for ethical approval? Uh, which parts of their request were granted? Which gra uh, parts were not granted? How long did it take the ethics committee to respond? Those kinds of questions. Or similarly, if I say, oh, they did a nice study here in Cologne, I want to repeat that in Kuala Lumpur. So can I just fork their ethics process and then adapt, replace Cologne by Kuala Lumpur and I'm done? No, because the entire process is hidden. And so um, I'm interested in uh, how, how to improve that. And I see several areas in which this, uh, there is actually an interest by the community. One of them is, for instance, medical databases. And so for uh, about a year, I was part of a team that managed a stem cell database where you have tissue donations, uh, cell line donations by people. And they have consent forms. Uh, for um, So if there is an entry in the stem cell database, there has to be a consent. Otherwise, uh, it's just not allowed. And uh, those consents so far were just, again, the usual scanned paper PDFs. Uh, and But now we're in the process, or they are, because I'm not part of it anymore, but I helped design the fair aspects of it. Um, and so uh, they're now in the process of converting that into a system whereas, uh, where you actually have fair data about the consent. So kind of we pull out the key aspects of the, from this paper thing, and then we structure this and uh, give it a, like a fair, fair structure so that you can use it as an additional filter when searching this kind of database. The other, uh, let's say, application area in which I think a fair ethics process uh, would be interesting is anything related to AI. If we want the AI to be compliant to any ethical standards, then we need to express the ethical standards in a way that a machine can make sense of. And uh, so far, we're very far from that. But technically, it's possible uh, because things like Eduroam Wi-Fi uh, content, uh, uh, like access management, is not much more complex but it works and has been working for a number of years, and we can take inspiration from that. So somehow we need to express the rights that somebody has to access certain kinds of information in a way that a machine can understand. And then we need to share certain metadata, like, uh, like which part of the ethics process is relevant for, uh, for, what, for whom, and then we need to uh, basically gather information about that and then uh, enrich the part of the manuscript and other parts, like the, the stem cell database, with metadata about this. And for that, there is, for instance, the digital use conditions, which is a new initiative that tries to um, capture the uh, consent that uh, patients or others gave in a machine-readable format, basically in an ontology kind of thing, so that you can express, yes, uh, my cell line uh, can be used for uh, cancer, well, let's say breast cancer research, but not colon cancer. It can be used uh, in Germany and in Argentina, but not in Colombia, uh, and, and things like that. And it can be used for commercial or non-commercial co purposes. Things like that can be expressed in a machine-readable fashion. And then uh, we have mechanisms to basically express the consent in a fair way, and uh, also the ethics process, like the ethical approval in a fair way. Technically, it's possible. Now, we just have to deal with the social part. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. So, uh, now I would like to uh, open uh, the forum for the questions. Considering the time, I would like to first get the uh, questions from audience. So, any questions to our panelists? Any comments? Maybe in my, meanwhile I can start. Uh, so what is what was very 
surprising for me, like in almost in all talks, uh, we first uh, mentioned the benefit of this real world data and how it can improve and how it can benefit uh, in different uh, aspects of the society, but also we are talking about societal changes and barriers. On the other hand, like industry doesn't have that kind of uh, problems probably, and they move very uh, fast, uh, using this real world data. Uh, do you think in research, like uh, how we can, uh, who do we need to, uh, let's say, uh, convince about removing those barriers? Why it is so different than industry in research? We cannot really, uh, why they can reuse this real data? Why we cannot reuse easily? I'd be happy to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think in many aspects, uh, we're, well, we're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. We work according to the principles of, you know, if you're if doing good or doing harm. If you don't know what the consequences of what you do and what you find and what you share, if it actually may hurt instead, you should be hesitant, or basically the principle that at least I work according to is then, n you know, n not do it. And we do have examples from research areas uh, where, uh, just very briefly, the uh, Signal Project from the Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives that were financed by uh, Clooney, uh, taking satellite pictures from Darfur to uh, um, monitor human rights violations of the government. And these pictures were real time and they could see masses of movements obviously going towards attacks to villages. And the researchers had a real problem. Do we warn the people or do we not? They decided they not to do it and they were very lucky, happy afterwards because it turned out that the, these military actions moved and they attacked another village first. So actually, if they had been warned, they would have met these troops halfway. So, I mean, so, so you need to think about these implications when you work with the real-time data and what it may have for those that you then think that you actually do something good for. So I think it's a question of what, you know, what, what's, what, what's the aim of it in the end. One of the research, the people that I work with on children born of war said that he felt that with us researchers, one of the problems was that you, we cannot see the line we passed, the red line, before we actually did it. And that's what happens in very many research areas where a lot of in information is not known, which is exactly why we tried to put this down in one article to at least give the PhD students we work with some awareness building with regard to what may encounter, but it's in no way complete. But that's the only way we think it can move forward. So I think that at least is one of the challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Being 10 years in the Committee for Industry Technology um, I, and working in the industry, I'd like to ask you back, are you sure that they don't? Yeah? I give you the example. Yeah? Uh, something 30 years ago, Walmart started to, cut, to distribute these shop cards, and mm. everyone thought it's for fun. It was not mm. for fun, they collected data. And what was the result? They could be, it, regulation didn't prohibit it to collect those kind of data, so no regulation, you can do it. Yeah? This is the rush in the wild. What is, what is not prohibited, you can do. That's the concept. Yeah? So they collected the data, what they did. They could be the biggest in the world among all the, all the shops. Yeah? in five years' time, because the others didn't do it. So the, it created a huge competitive advantage. But they did more. Sooner, th now they, you see it with all the commercials, they dictate the markets. They will tell to the producers, and they will tell to the farmers what they do. So they took the leadership, something nobody could imagine before. Um, how many chips the cars do have? And the information those, from those chips is gathered somewhere. But the European companies, I think, that are very, very kind of ethical, so they never talked to use it. But they had the data. It was a kind of side product. And then they recognized we can use it. We can use it for electric mobility. We can use it for the energy 
saving, we can use it for transformation. So they had it. But to give you the worst example, uh, when the sector moved to the renew renewable energy and all these big windmills were established 20 years ago it started, nobody could imagine that it will be full of chips measuring all kinds of data, the material in the air, the birds, the biosphere, the stratosphere, whatever they could do from the windmill top with the sensors built in. And nobody ever talked that time uh, that the windmills maybe have sensors for other purpose. If you look TikTok, TikTok used the data for surveillance mm. and to nudging you. So the industry does use the data because there are no rules. So sooner or later, we have to have a rules. Just because we are not aware, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. If someone invented it, we'll do it first and we'll make it absolutely like in the rush in the wild, in the gold age last century in California, the same thing is happening. So we have to legislate it sooner or later, but we cannot legislate it until we understand it better. And that was the original idea why the commission suggested that me as a legislator, with the understanding of these IT technical issues, would enter to the RDA to help them to navigate and to get understanding the legislation where we have to act. We are not there yet, but just because we do not know, it doesn't mean that they don't do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, Maybe like also in healthcare, there are lots of insecurities about using or not using data, isn't that, Julia? Like, yes, that's true. And maybe also uh, coming back to the first point. So I think in, so I can only t uh, say something to the medical sector because I've not seen any other. But uh, I always feel that a big part of the issue is bureaucracy. So it's not actually that anybody wants to wants to um, yeah, delay some projects or prohibit them, but it's more like, yeah, but in paragraph this and that, we say that we need this and that document, and then I tell you, but, but for my use case, it's not applicable, but the paragraph is this, and then we do it that way. So I think we just generally, especially also in the medical domain, where I cannot now speak from, for, um, we just need some more pragmatical approaches to that so that we actually also adapt to changes. Because, I mean, all these explorative big data approaches, they've not been around for too long. So we just need the, the frameworks, the, the regulations to widen up a bit and to be more pragmatical, I would say. And that would also, as you, because you asked for the insecurities in medicine, I think it would also help to reduce the insecurities if we just would go into dialogue with ethical uh, institutions, with, with data protection institutions, with IT security institutions, and just have regular meetings discussing project IDs. Um, this intense communication would help a lot instead of strict bureaucracy. I'd actually like to pick up on this bureaucracy thing. One aspect uh, of open science that is not really talked about much is that open science is perceived as yet another layer of bureaucracy, whereas if done right, it could actually help reduce several layers of bureaucracy mm -hmm. because much of the bureaucracy that we have exists because we're dealing with many black boxes. Mm -hmm. If some of those black boxes are opened up, some of the need for uh, the existing bureaucracy goes away. And so uh, lots of researchers and others in the research ecosystem complain about uh, the bureaucracy, and rightly so, um, but we're not really jumping on the opportunities that would be offered by just opening up some key parts of the system and thereby reducing the bureaucracy. Thank and you. to come back to the companies, I think uh, to them we could apply the same system. <laughs> uh, so if they are more open about it, we can reduce the bu bureaucracy for them as well, and that is an incentive for them. And so there, there could be more real-life data shared publicly, or at least metadata, uh, so that the public knows more about what kind of data the companies actually have in exchange for uh, reduced bureaucracy. Just one point on this. The European Union now uh, making the legislation around the common data spaces. There are big, 10 big common data lakes 
yeah, they call the common data lakes. Uh, the two biggest one is actually for health and the other one for climate, but they do it for mobility, they do it for agriculture, uh, they do it for, EO, EOSC is one of them, yeah? So EOSC is the data lake for research on the longer term. Uh, so I think that there is something ongoing at the moment, but when you imagine the sinus curve I described, we are at the very, very beginning, yeah? But in the inflection, if we arrive to the inflection point, then it will be a huge and fast growth. And we have to be able to ready by our institutions that we are able to absorb and deploy all these big changes. Come on, uh, if you are interested, visit the Common Data Spaces website and you will be surprised about those data lakes and how fast they are kind of deploying around the world. Yeah. Uh, maybe I would like to uh, pick up from that point. Now, currently, as a society, we are investing a lot on this data infrastructure, data spaces. In Germany alone, we have uh, NFTI projects. Uh, in medical domain, we have medical informatics infrastructure. Even in our hospital, we have data integration center. And at EU level, there are lots of layers. Uh, European Open Science Cloud, now data lakes, and uh, when this investment will pay off and what will be the conditions for that? Uh, because as a uh, director of this uh, data, uh, data integration center, every day I see new challenges and sometimes I feel very desperate to make this data really open up and make it usable. Uh, and in some point, uh, people might feel like, like we are... Uh, not progressing and staying at the same point, uh, but what will foster this development? Should I be the one to start? Uh, uh, um, I, 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 yeah, bec because it's happening in Europe. Yeah, Europe has two strategic mission. Yeah, digitizing Europe and greening Europe, parallel. Yeah, these are the two flags. We are better doing now with the greening. Yeah in the policy layer, but in the digitizing, we do with the infrastructure layer. Yeah? We build things into the system. Yeah? And we are getting now with the kind of monitoring system under the Digital Decade Program. If you are interested, you look at the DESI index. Yeah, it's called the DESI index, which actually combines the green and digitizing. And it will grow. Yeah? If we digitize, it will come with the carbon footprint. Yeah? Especially the blockchain requires so many energy that you have to build a reactor, nuclear reactor now in the US to manage the blockchain. Yeah? So it's certainly not sustainable on the longer term. But digitization also is a possibility to save, yeah? helping already the environmental, environmental sector. But the issue I raised here, it's uh, something what the researchers could do directly. Do we really need so many copies? Yeah? If it's a 130, I talked about it a lot. It's a 130 copy. If we reduce it for 13, yeah, it's a 10, scale of 10. So the energy efficiency for research data is around 10% from that point of view. You know what? We burn coal with 33% of energy efficiency. So we are three times worse than the coal burning, which is now phasing out of Europe. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So my advice is that you go out a bit from your ivory tower and you look at the very normal other sectors that how fast they are growing. You cannot stay as you are. Pantare, yeah? The world is moving, and you, society, trust you so much. The digital infrastructure for research can be done at the EU and at national level because the citizens give their consent that the politicians can vote those budgets and or infrastructure building. Without that, it will not happen. But we have a responsibility you have a responsibility, all the citizens have a responsibility to turn it and use it, maximize it. Because if we lose the society, if we lose the trust, the alternative is the fake news. The alternative is whatever we do not wish to have. The alternative is a California gold rush. Hmm? Thank you. Because of the time issues, I would like to close the uh, panel discussion in here. As a takeaway, as a scientist, we have lots of responsibilities, and hopefully we will carry on that. Uh, and I would like to thank to all panelists and uh, audience also for the questions, and I give the stage back. <laughs>